This evening of Monday Thursday is one of the most solemn of our services throughout the church year. For it is an evening when we must be confronted again with how it is that our sins, our failures, made the cross necessary. Know that tonight we will be having the sacrament of Holy Communion. For those of you who are watching this online, you may pause this video for a moment and get something for a bite to eat and something to drink. Set it aside that you may celebrate communion as we come to that portion of the service. We are continuing to read portions uh, through the 26th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. Uh, you will hear various things uh, throughout the service that remind us of some of the events of those last days and hours of his life. And so I begin our service with words from uh, Matthew 26, beginning with verse 20. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him one after the other, Surely not I, Lord. Jesus replied, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. And Jesus answered, Yes, it is you. Let us worship God. We come this evening to our time of prayer. Let's pray. Mm -hmm. 
Gracious God, blessed God, before your holy presence, we realize the depth of our sinfulness and the shallowness of our devotion. Like the disciples, we look more to our own self-interest and less to your call to be self-giving. Here was Jesus whose heart was torn in two inside as he prepared to give his life for the sake of the world. And then there was the disciples. They could barely keep their eyes open in the Garden of Gethsemane. They could not watch and pray with Jesus in his time of need. We seek your grace in Jesus Christ, for on our own we are undeserving of your love. We pray for all who are lost in doubt or sin, grief or fear. Our very humanity links us together, for we have all done what is wrong in your sight. And as the darkness of the world closes in, crushing our spirit, it is Christ who gives us strength. He was an innocent man, yet condemned to physical torture, unjustly sentenced to death for our sakes. We pray for all who suffer abuse at the hand of others. Those who are dealing with pain from medical ailments, those whose life have been torn asunder by violence, terrorism, warfare. Thank you, Lord, that Jesus understands our pain, our fears, and our loss. Some days our burdens seem unbearable. And yet, as we looked to the cross, we know we are not alone in our pain. And we pray for all persons who are in suffering this day. We pray for those whose faith has become weakened by hardship or eroded through stress or neglect. Thank you to all those who reach out to another in comfort and compassion, those who are a witness of faith despite difficult times. So hear our prayers, Lord, for we give you our burdens and we lay them at the foot of the cross. So give us the grace that we may gaze upon you on days when we falter and there find renewed strength. For you take our yoke upon your shoulders. You make our burden light. So may Christ's death confront us with a new resolve to change because by his stripes we are healed. Hear all our prayers, for we pray in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and we pray as he taught us to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Yeah.
communion. Know that the cross, it is all about God's love. So great that he sent his only son for our sake, that he should take on all of our transgressions, all that would separate us from the Father. Hear these words from Isaiah 53. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, 
and by his stripes we are healed. And so it was, it was recorded in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26, verse 17, that on the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He replied, go into the city to a certain man and tell him, the teacher says, my appointed time is near. I am going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. As we come tonight in this evening, may we who are at table with our God be in prayer. Let's pray. We praise you, O oh God, for you brought forth bread upon this earth. You give us the fruit of the vine. So we ask that you would bless this bread and this cup. Bless us as we receive them. By your grace, make us worthy of your son's sacrifice given for us. Let us see in these elements the body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Hear our prayers. For we know that Christ's death was made necessary by sin. Open our eyes to your great love given in him. Help us know the heart of Jesus as we seek to follow him. Forgive us for that which we have done that has separated us from you. As we ask forgiveness, as we repent of the wrongs, so open us to receive the blessings you are so eager to give. We ask too that you will bless us with your Holy Spirit bless us bless these elements of the bread and cup that we may be fed by the body and blood of your son that we may be filled by his life and goodness so strengthen us to do your work as your body in the world unite us as Christ's people give us your peace in union with your whole church universal, we praise you with humble hearts, for we pray in Christ our Savior. Amen. For it was on the night when Jesus was betrayed that he sat at table with his disciples having the Passover meal. And he took bread, he blessed it, he broke it, he gave it to them and said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way also after supper he took the cup, he poured it out and blessed it and gave it to them saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Each time you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. And so, with this bread and with this cup, we celebrate his death until he comes. I invite you to take a morsel of whatever food you have that is available, be it bread, be it a cracker, I know that this is Christ's body broken for you. Eat it in remembrance of him. And take whatever beverage you have 
For as we share together, we are celebrating the great gift of our Jesus for us in his shed blood. For this is the cup of the new covenant shed for you. Drink of it, all of you, in remembrance of him. Let's pray. Almighty God, thank you. For you deliver us from the darkness that is despair, brokenness, and death. Thank you. For you offer us the life-giving life of Jesus Christ. For he offered his life to redeem us all. We praise you for your mercy, for the love that you offer through his body and blood. Make us one with you by your grace in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>
We are reading from the portion of Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26, beginning with verse 36 to 46 this evening. This is the account of Jesus with prayer at Gethsemane. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter. Watch and pray, so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour is near, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hand of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. May God bless a reading and understanding of his holy word. Amen. In each of the gospel accounts, we read how Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane with, with great conviction, even anguish. Luke's gospel says that as Jesus prayed with great passion of spirit, his sweat was like drops of blood falling on the ground. This was one of Jesus' most difficult moments as he prayed three times for God's will to be done. He said, Father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. So the scene is emotionally tense. Jesus prayed with great fervency. He persevered in prayer until his will was in line with the Father's. Now Matthew writes that Jesus was sorrowful and troubled as he prayed in the garden. He told the disciples, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He asked them to stay and keep watch with him. The Gospels record that each time Jesus prayed, he returned to find that the disciples, they, his closest companions, could not keep watch with him. Jesus begged them to watch and pray not to fall into temptation. But their eyes were heavy. They kept falling asleep. They were exhausted from sorrow. And they did not know how to reply to him. Jesus kept asking them to remain watchful, but they could not. And Jesus said of them, The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. So tonight, it, it is a night of prayer on this most solemn service of our church year. And the stakes are especially high, for we are confronted, like the disciples, of, of a sense of inadequacy 
in the face of the evil that was impending upon Jesus. Like the disciples, precisely when they most needed to pray, they found it was impossible. Words would not come. They felt overwhelmed and worried and fell asleep. And you too may well have been in situations like that, where it feels like the prayers are going no higher than the ceiling, and your spirit feels just laden, as if there's nothing there. Surely the disciples were aware that they were letting Jesus down, and how much worse the situation was for them. Because Jesus persevered in prayer, they failed. Well, we can hardly speak of Jesus without noting the great importance he put in prayer throughout his ministry. When there were important decisions to be made or before significant events that occurred, the Gospels portrayed Jesus as being in prayer. Now, Luke's Gospel especially is one that portrays Jesus as a man of prayer. Luke says that when Jesus was being baptized, he was in prayer. When heaven opened and the Holy Spirit descended in the form of a dove. Luke said how Jesus would go out to a solitary place before daybreak. Here he would be preparing for his work of teaching and healing. And crowds of people would come to hear him, to be healed by him. And Jesus made sure that he had time in a solitary place in prayer. Well, before Jesus chose his 12 disciples, it is recorded that he spent that whole night before on a mountainside in prayer. Another time when Jesus was praying, he asked his disciples, who do the crowds say that I am? And Peter was led to answer that Jesus was the Christ. Another occasion, Jesus took several of his disciples up a mountain there to pray. And while Jesus was in prayer, his whole appearance changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. That was the transfiguration. Jesus taught his disciples about prayer. His life modeled his commitment to prayer. It is written how Jesus appointed 72 followers. He sent them ahead to every town where Jesus was to go. And he told them to pray for God, to send workers out into the harvest field. And when they returned, Jesus, filled with joy through the Holy Spirit, praised God for his word revealed to those who had hearts like young children. Now the Gospels record a number of words to prayers that Jesus prayed. And, and as we read those prayers, those words, we can sense the intensely close relationship that God and Jesus had. Jesus said that he and the Father were one. To see the Son was to know the Father. God has given all things to Jesus, the Son. Jesus has given us the privilege of knowing the Father, for Jesus has chosen to reveal God to us through him. Now, John's Gospel, chapter 17, is an entire chapter devoted to a prayer 
of Jesus. And this at the very close of his life is John's, uh, I say, portrayal of the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. And it contains prayers that God would glorify his son with glory that Jesus had with the Father since before the world began. Jesus prays for his disciples, for all believers, that they may be one as God and Jesus are one. So in the first section, um, Jesus prays as he says to God, I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. It makes me think, you know, I don't know about you, but I can get so caught up in a project, uh, something, a plan I want to get finished. But in the meantime, I can forget the bigger plan that God has for my life because my Life goal is to fulfill whatever tasks God has asked of me. What Jesus prays, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me. And they accepted them. We are privileged to receive what Jesus gave us. We have been called to be his. He said, while I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe. He prays that God will protect them from the evil one. And he prays for all who will come after to believe in Jesus, that they may be one, even as Jesus and the Father are one. So Jesus lived his life as an example that we may follow after him. I'd like to share words, uh, actually, that were written from the book, uh, What the Prayers of Jesus Tell Us About the Heart of God, a book written by Shane Stanford. And he writes, it is important not to miss the fact that as Jesus is talking about wisdom and truth and what it means to find real direction in the world, the conversation is set within the context of trouble. The Bible is clear that God works faithfully and sometimes best in the midst of our most broken and most trying seasons. Jesus believed there is no better time in our lives to seek after real wisdom and real, and real truth than when we are facing pushback, difficulties, or sorrows. Great words. So here in Matthew's Gospel, uh, the prayer of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, it's among his last words to his disciples. And, and, and like we're just written, just in the midst of great trials, great difficulties. And so we want to pay attention to what Jesus is doing at that time. The disciples, they have seen Jesus with a heart of compassion as, they, as he healed. They have witnessed his power in performing miracles, his authority in teaching God's word. They have seen righteous anger towards injustices perpetuated by religious authorities. They were there, even as Jesus was tired and slept through a storm at sea. But here, in the Garden of Gethsemane, despite their fog of despair and fatigue, there they witnessed distraught emotion in Jesus as he pleaded with the Father to be released from the cup of his sacrifice, but only if it was God's will. 
And it is a difficult passage to read, to realize how much Jesus at that moment needed the support of his closest disciples, needed their prayers, and yet how little they were able to give him. Certainly Jesus experienced a, I say, a spiritual onslaught from the evil one at the beginning of his ministry with the temptations. And here, Jesus experienced an equally, I, I say, intense spiritual crisis as he prayed in the garden. If God would release him from this last need for sacrifice. And yet, he prayed to be obedient to the Father's will. So, Jesus was not sheltered from the barbs of the tempter. And neither are we. Jesus prayed with great intensity to be able to accept his role as a sacrifice for sin. And prayer for us is equally critical. Because on a daily basis, we encounter conflicting desires about, you know, how do we live our lives versus how God wants us to live. And we certainly we pray to God that our desires may be fulfilled, that God help me do what I want. And yet, how hard it is giving up our will in order to embrace the Father's will. You know, I don't know about you, but we can expend so much emotional energy fighting to be free, if we can put it that way, rather than experiencing the peace of resting within the Father's embrace, doing exactly what we were called to do, using the skills and gifts that we were blessed with from the day we were born. Why do we fight? Why do we? This prayer in the garden helps me see that it's not my will that counts. It's yours, God. Jesus certainly understood the temptation to self-will, even as he prayed for the strength to follow God's will. We live in a world of sin and sorrow, but to follow God is to deny my self-will that I, in some measure, may be obedient to God's plan because otherwise I will have wasted the very reason for which God has placed me here on this earth. And you and I could have a long life. But if we have done nothing that fulfills the purpose for which God created us, we've really accomplished nothing. Because Jesus said his will was to do the will of his Father who sent him. For Jesus came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And Jesus said that if we are to come after him, we are to take up our cross daily and follow him. Like Jesus every day, we make the choice whether to give up the easy life, the self-centered life, maybe even a life marked by greed or gain. Like Jesus, sometimes it is agonizingly difficult to turn away from self-will and choose self-sacrifice. But Jesus knew how the world can influence us to conform to its standard and how much the world takes a toll on our emotional and spiritual strength. We too can be left empty and drained 
because our bodies cannot endure that load that is thrust upon us on occasion. You know what I mean. These are messages to, you know, live your life with gusto, forge your own path, be your own drummer. But then there's Jesus saying, Father, for it is not as I will, but as you will. For Jesus prays here, yes, for himself, but also in a real sense for us, that we would be shaped and filled not by the sire and call of the world, but by the wisdom of God. Amen. As we conclude this, our online Monday, Thursday, know that at noon, the whole country became dark, and that darkness lasted for three hours as Jesus hung on the cross. And at three o'clock, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those standing by said, he's calling Elijah. One of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he died. Now a centurion was there, and those who were guarding Jesus They saw the earthquake and saw all that had happened. They were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. Go in peace, for our Savior died.
for us all. Amen.